My name is uh, Kiran. I'm from the Singapore Economic Development Board. Five years ago, we embarked on a vision. How do we make Singapore the undisputed digital capital in Asia where new products, new services, new business models, new partnerships are fostered in a vibrant ecosystem to serve Asia and beyond? Um, over the last five years, we have seen amazing tipping points happen in Southeast Asia. You've heard some of the broad numbers. But let me give you a picture on the ground of what's happening. We have had investments from many companies, global or local, large and small, fast-going uh, tech startups as well. And many of them are creating frontier technology jobs in Singapore. Everybody from Google, Facebook, Salesforce, Amazon, Apple, Grab, Carousel, C Group, Lazada, and many others. What's happening? What's happening in Southeast Asia that this momentum is continuing? According to Google and Tomasek, the opportunity in Southeast Asia by 2025 for the internet economy is going to be worth $240 billion. It's a huge opportunity. In the last three years, we have seen $24 billion in venture capital go into 2,400 firms. It's pervasive, it's broad, and it's escalating. I think we are only at the beginning innings of this game. So we're going to now move from Silicon Valley, the tech epicenter, into Southeast Asia, one of the biggest growth theaters for technology in the digital economy. So I'm very happy to have uh, Siri and uh, Hui Ling here. Uh, we've been working with Grab and Carousel over the many years to help you, catalyze you, accelerate you in your growth. Uh, to address the opportunity in Southeast Asia. Born in Southeast Asia, pan-Asian, unicorn, to be unicorn, carousel, and perhaps a decacorn, uh, grab. So with that, you know, I just wanted to move and see what Patrick mentioned earlier. Frontier growth. You've heard from how an American company born here is globalizing and looking at Asia. Frontier growth. But if you look at Southeast Asia, and we've heard the big numbers, if you double-click frontier growth, from your vantage points and what you see, what does that mean to you? Really? Opportunity. Um, so I'll give a bit of context, and I'm really glad to be back in San Francisco. Folks, uh, before heading back to Grab, I was actually, actually in your shoes. I spent four years in San Francisco, two years in Boston, and I was in San Francisco. The last job I had here was with Salesforce. And in Salesforce, I was responsible for something called the TAM model, one of the many things, right? Total addressable market. And it wasn't just Salesforce, every single big enterprise MNC company did this where they tried to prioritize highest potential areas of growth today and tomorrow. And I remember always looking for Southeast Asia at the bottom of the list. It would never cross any sort of threshold that was worth discussing or putting in the slide. That was how the rest of the world looked at Grab before we started it, and therefore when we started it, people were asking us questions like, what in the world are you doing and why? Right? And this came from friends, it came from colleagues, and it definitely came from my mother. <laughs> right. um, but call it you know, naive ambition, call it hope, call it aspiration. Um, this was the reason why Anthony, my dear co-founder and I, started the company almost seven years ago now. And when we did it, everybody was asking us, do you have plans to globalize? Southeast Asia only? Why? Is it big enough? What are you doing? It's so difficult. A, B, C, all the way to Z, and then they'll start back at A again. All the reasons why we shouldn't do it. But in our eyes, we saw opportunity because we saw a huge market with significant unserved needs in a very local way, and we saw the ability of technology to help us leapfrog, particularly smartphone mobile technology, in ways that were not possible before. We took a bet because we were passionate about the area. We wanted to solve a social need. We believed there was a sustainable, scalable way of doing it in an economically viable way as well. And in many ways, that bet has paid off in you know, dimensions we were not expecting or hoping for. And every time we hit the next new milestone in terms of what we believe Southeast Asia 
you know, that oyster has for us and the people of grab our grabbers and the communities, the 600 plus that we million, 600 plus million that we serve, we just think, oh my gosh, there's so much more. And that's why my one word answer is opportunity. And I'll hand over to <laughs> good Sure here. Um, yeah, so, so my name is Sure. Um, also good to be back. So actually I was here back in um, 2011. So a couple of years ago, I was part of this um, program called NUS Overseas Colleges. Um, in Silicon Valley, and it was a life-changing year for me. So, you know, I came here, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, oh, fans here. I think NOC fans, who are the NOC people in the house? I know they're fans. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Make sure you use that privilege to go and solve problems, okay? Um, but anyway, I, I think this was the year that, that um, me and my co-founders actually, uh, 2011, really got inspired by technology and how we can actually use technology to solve problems at scale. Um, and, you know, when we went back to Singapore, um, our lives were changed. So I was in business school in NUS, and, you know, in business school, uh, people tell you that, you know, from day one, like when you go for career services talks, they say, like, success is um, clearing 13 rounds of Goldman Sachs interview and, like, or joining McKinsey or something, right? Um, and, and it was, was um, actually something that I kind of believe. And until 2011, when um, NOC came about, my life changed and tech was a thing. Uh, came back, decided to learn how to build apps, and me and my co-founders just started hacking on stuff and eventually discovered a problem to be solved that was our own um, and realized that this problem that we're solving actually served a lot more people than ourselves. And that gave us the confidence to make our parents very angry and do a carousel full-time. Uh, so it's been about seven years since, um, uh, and it's been such a privilege and such an amazing journey. Uh, like for us, when, when we discovered Southeast Asia, it was also kind of accidental. Uh, so for us, we were just kind of a bunch of geeks who just wanted to build apps um, and, and solve a problem. And, and so we started in Singapore, and then we qu quickly realized that um, there were such unique challenges to be solved just in our backyard, in our neighborhood. You know, we have a sprawling population of 600 plus million people. Uh, you know, two thirds of them are still only just experiencing the magic of the internet. Um, and leapfrogging the desktop internet entirely. So we've got you know, these phones that we use all the time now, and you know, we are the perfect generation to be building mobile first because we are spending all our, on mobile, all, all our time on mobile. And, and this is, uh, you know, the problems that we can solve in Southeast Asia is actually quite unique. Uh, so Southeast Asia, massive population, but each Southeast Asian nation you go to is so interesting, so unique, and so challenging. Um, so when you go to a market like Indonesia, I remember going there for the first time and my friends were warning us that, hey, the internet here is a little bit spotty, it's 3G, but just know it's a badge. Um, so it's actually 2G speeds if it works at all. And you know, true enough, when we were on the ground actually watching our users use the app, um, people were scrolling the app, looking um, through the listings with white towels. And you know, being in Singapore and being in Silicon Valley, you'll be solving really, you know, first world problems in first world infrastructure. But if you go to the emerging markets, you've got to really consider things like localization, infrastructure, delivery networks are poor. Uh, you know, to get from one building to another in Jakarta, just across the road, sometimes it takes a 30 minute um, taxi ride in Bluebird before Grab came along with <laughs> Grab bikes. Uh, so, so there are really interesting, unique challenges to be solved in, in Southeast Asia. And I think that appeals to the the techies in ourselves, right? Like it's, um, you want to solve hard problems and these are incredibly hard problems to solve. Um, all the way from bandwidth to languages, how do you serve, um, you know, six, seven markets, different um, kinds of um, currencies, challenges, um, and, you know, varying types of economies as well. So in, in Southeast Asia, you've got the Singapore's, you've got Hong Kong, Taiwan nearby, which we serve. And then you've got the markets, emerging markets like Philippines, Indonesia, whole different world. So, so you've got to think about scaling your technology and products um, in very interesting and challenging ways, and I think that appeals to a lot of technologists. Uh, both of you are more than doubling your headcount uh, in Singapore uh, almost every year, given these opportunities that you face. I want to come to purpose and the problem you're trying to solve as a ride-hailing slash super app company, as well as an e-commerce player. How do you get your staff motivated to come to work every day to solve these amazing problems and write the opportunities in Asia and also your value proposition for 
new engineers or new staff to join you? What's that purpose? What's your passion? How do you get them to come? We're such typical Southeast Asians and Singaporeans. <laughs> don't want to come on stage first, don't want to answer the question first. Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab at this first, right? Um, good news is I don't think we need to motivate our grabbers at all. We are very fortunate that we have you know, 6,000 plus amazing grabbers who are self-motivated, purpose-driven. And to be honest, these folks are not only just folks from Southeast Asia. Um, we have actually now, as of today or maybe two weeks ago, 52 nationalities across Grab. So we were talking about CQ earlier. I'm like, hallelujah, because it's the thing that enables us to do what we're doing. Because in the eight countries in Southeast Asia that we serve, right, 300 plus cities, each one is so extremely unique. And the reason why we've been able to continue solving the crazy problems that we have, let's not use right hailing anymore. Super app is, is Grab's future. We've bought, been on this path for a year and it's been a tremendous trajectory and new growth for us and we're early in, on that journey. And the reason why we're constantly thinking about what's the next new problem that we can solve and want to solve together is because our grabbers are great. And the thing that makes our grabbers great is something that we interview for. Uh, it's called four H's. There was a heavy dose of, of the components of four H's being talked in the panel earlier. One is humility, my favorite of all the four. Two is the hunger to just want to just do more. And three is the heart for that purpose that just comes from somewhere inside, right? I thank all of your pa parents, all the different governments and schools that you went for because clearly we didn't build that or create that. Um, you know, our, our folks have that inherently in their gut. And then, of course, number four is just the honor to just do what is right and fulfill the words that you say that you want to do and act on it and take action and close it out where it matters, right? So we have the fortune of being able to attract talent like this. Um, I will also share that ability to do so seven years ago was not the same. Uh, I used to make trips out to SF where it was just me trying so hard to like get anybody to come back to this company at that point called My Taxi, then called Grab Taxi, and then now Grab, right? But back then, nobody wanted to join us because back then, the tech infrastructure and ecosystem in Southeast Asia didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Now, we're hoping, and that's why we're here, we're all here together, that we can be part of a larger journey and change, right? Where folks are spending good time here. We also have an office in Seattle, by the way. So we're sending you know, our, our local folks to Seattle office. We're bringing folks from the States back to Southeast Asia. We have an office, R&D office in Beijing, Seattle, Bangalore, beyond our uh, Southeast Asian uh, regions as well, R&D centers. And the reason why we did it initially was because we were desperate, to be honest. We couldn't find talent locally at the scale and depth that we needed. Now everybody looks back, hindsight 2020, they say, oh my God, you guys, amazing. You know, you have this global R&D uh, strategy right now that makes so much sense, let's all copy it. And we're like, oh. You know, that was our last frontier and approach of trying to find the best talent possible, right? So that's why we're here, because ultimately, the changes that we're trying to make and build are only possible because of the people that we have. The people that we have are inherently hungry for purpose hungry for change. Um, we have a cheesy tagline, you can thank Anthony and, and myself for it. Our vision in Grab is to drive Southeast Asia forward. Super app it is, but still got the right healing initial <laughs> starts, right? So we're cheesy and we're happy about it. Um, and that's what we want to continue doing, right? Yeah, um, so, so Grab, um, you know, seven years ago I was struggling, Carousel still struggling. Just, you know. <laughs> um, we're a much smaller company, uh, but massive ambition. You know, one of the things that we, we care a lot about um, and, and wakes us up every single day, all, about, all 450 of us at Carousel, um, really is our mission. So, so if you come to our office, and I love to host some of you guys, or all of you guys, if you ever um, come by in, in Tanjung Paga, um, as, as you, the first thing you'll see is actually our mission statement planted in the wall. And, and our mission at Carousel is to inspire every person in the world to start selling, and you know, with each transaction, we create possibility for one, for one another. Uh, and, and that's that mission that really keeps us going as a company. Um, so one of the things that 
we benefit from at Carousel is that um, it's a product that's very personal. It's a product that all of you, you and I, um, actually could use, and all of us at Carousel actually use it. And um, it's a product that when you take the MRT, you walk around the streets, you go for family gatherings, your uncle, auntie will come up to you and report a bug. Um, and you feel extremely proud about that. <laughs> you know, and actually we, we feel really happy whenever someone reports a bug because they at least care enough about the product to want to report a bug. Um, and you know, most, most products that you ship don't even get the love of your customers and people don't even care about it because just because it's so competitive. So we're extremely grateful whenever someone reports a bug. So me and my co-founders and all of our early employees used to reply, reply to every single um, customer support email ourselves and I, I used to welcome every single person who signed up for Carousel personally my email, my, my name, um, because it was just such a, a great way to get feedback. And, and the other thing that makes us really proud is um, if you look at our mission statement, it's, it's not inspiring every person in Southeast Asia to start selling. But in, inherently, it's about the world. The, the problem that we're solving actually is a, is a fundamentally uh, global one. So we believe that everyone in this world actually has something in their life that's underutilized and unused that should go on and benefit someone else. Um, and if you think about five, ten years ago, it was so unthinkable that you live in someone else's home when you travel on a vacation. But today you have Airbnb, so it's actually doable. Um, the thing five, ten years, ten years ago, you get from point A to point B into some, in using someone else's car, again, it was unthinkable. And today you have got Grab and many other big right-handing companies. Um, and we like to think that in the next five to ten years, Carousel would like to play that part in shaping how people would consume stuff for the needs in their life. So if you actually need something, um, why actually turn to the retail markets first? Why can't you turn to the peer-to-peer -peer marketplace first and actually shop from everyone's closet or storeroom because you're likely to have that gadget you bought from Slick Deals or that like, um, Black Friday or Cyber Monday sale, you used once and you never used it again. And that, that actually can go on to benefit someone else. And we've got many, many of such stories that keep us going. So again, another thing that you, come, you see in our office is just our meeting rooms are actually painted with actually actual user stories. So one of them is actually a personal um, one that was, that's very dear to my heart you know, because we're bootstrapping Carousel for 18 months with just our own salaries. Um, at some point, we, me and my co-founder discussed, should we just go and build apps for other people because no one was using our service? But this one story kept me going. So this was the MacBook story. It was my old MacBook. It was displaced by a shiny MacBook Air, new. And my old white MacBook was just sitting there collecting dust. So I just listed it for sale in Carousel. Um, this guy came to the office to pick it up. He's a dad. So I asked him, Worst sales pitch, right? My computer is a bit slow and it's old already. Why are you still buying my computer? And he told me that he, he wanted his nine-year-old daughter to actually learn the internet. Um, and he couldn't afford a brand new computer. And this is in Singapore. And so my old dusty MacBook that was slow actually went on to help this nine-year-old girl learn the internet. And who knows what that access to the internet would have created for her in her life today. Um, and there are many, many of such stories. So Uncle Postman, 60-plus-year-old guy, you know, works 12 hours a day, delivering mail to 2,000 households, got gout, turned to carousel, got an e-bike for free because the seller heard his story. Um, and the seller was so fulfilled because he actually managed to touch someone else's life. But for me and my team, we were blown away. What was Uncle Postman, 60-plus-year-old, doing on carousel in the first place? And I think that's one of the things that, as technologists, we are also quite proud of. You know, one of our design philosophies at Carousel is to make selling as simple as taking a photo and buying as simple as chatting. And a lot of you guys would know that building simple products is extremely difficult. But building simple products is extremely important because it creates access, it creates accessibility, even for 60-plus-year-old Uncle Postman who needed this e-bike to improve his life. So these are the stories and actual impact that really keep us going, that keep us um, serving the mission every single day. Um, and it's been seven years in, we still think we're less than 1% done, um, and we hope to truly build something meaningful and enduring with Carousel. So thanks for sharing that. I have so many friends who work for both of you in your organizations, and I always hear, no matter how large Carousel and Grab gets in terms of people working in your offices, in your regional footprint, something that's amazing that I hear a lot is that it still feels 
like a fast, innovative startup even today, when you have a few hundred, few thousand people working for you. How do you as leaders shift over time to actually preserve that culture, very much like what Amazon speaks about day one? How do you define your day one journeys as leaders? And what, what are you doing in your organizations to keep it hungry, purpose-driven, with passion? Maybe now we can have Siri. <laughs> I, I think it, in many ways, that mission statement is still our North Star. When you think about the world as your market, um, you know, it's really humbling. You're truly less than 1% done. Um, and, you know, I, I think for us, one of the things that we, we are very deliberate about also is um, reiterating culture, values. You know, me and my co-founders still interview everyone that joins Carousel. So everyone who joins Carousel has a co-founders round. And, and the, the intent here is for us to really you know, tease out the values of a person. Um, and we are guided by, by four, five core values. And actually, one of them was actually humility as well. So one of them is stay humble. Um, and that's why we, we constantly think we're less than 1% done, because we truly are. Um, but I, I think also the, the, the core values of problem solving is so important, right? And if you, you stay anchored on your users, your customers, and always solve problems for them, like you're always going to be innovating and improving your products. So that's one value that we want to have in people. Like, are you a problem solver um, across everything that you do, right? Second thing is we want people to have this inherent care um, for users and customers. So care deeply is, is one of our core values. Um, and the other one is about being mission first. No one's ego should come in the way of the mission. Um, and, and one that's really dear to our hearts uh, because we are a very, very poor startup with no money is being relentlessly resourceful. You know, even today, um, you know, where after raising some venture capital, it's, you know, tiny from the grand scheme of things compared to the ambition that we have. So we've got to be ex extremely relentlessly resourceful in, in how um, we approach problems actually grow. And, and actually counterintuitively, we like to ask people to think, what if you had actually no money, how would you actually grow your product and your service? Or how would you actually achieve those goals that we set you? Um, and we like to think that these constraints actually end up causing you to create very novel ideas, 10x ideas that otherwise um, someone else with a media budget uh, would not be able to come up with. So, so these are some things that we, we articulate all the time. So we, we interview and hire for these people. We repeat stories. We celebrate um, values. We have, you know, on Slack, these little uh, reactions that um, have our each icon for each core value. So we actually credit people against that. Um, we have our one carousel spirit that we, we cel celebrate. So we, we constantly tell people that we fight hard together, we make magic happen together, and we win together. So it's, it's constantly repeating that and being deliberate about these cultures. Um, and even now, as we become 450 people, values are not enough. We actually translate that to working principles and actually tell people you've got to be speaking up, especially in Asian culture, right? Like, you come up with a well-considered plan that's debated, it's okay. You've got to be explicit about these things in, in building an organization. So, so something that me and my co-founders obsess about and we um, you know, constantly just talk about it, yeah. Wailing, I've heard uh, in Grab, uh, one of my friends who's working there, he put out a proposal once to the leadership, um, and the leadership's response was that, that's not big enough. You're not thinking big enough. And the person said, well, I'm from consulting and I'm from banking, and I actually know how this works. There's no way we can get this done in one year. It's impossible. You're not thinking big enough. Then the next question was, how can I help you remove obstacles or make connections such that that can happen? Is that true? Sounds very much like what Anthony and I would say. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll address your first question and then I'll, I'll get back to the example that you shared. And I'm kind of keen to hear who that came from now. <laughs> um, you know, I agree with everything that Siri mentioned, right? Values, mission, all extremely important to keep top of mind. And as I shared, for us, the most important check is when we interview a potential grabber, and whether or not we decide that, hey, this person shares the same hunger and spirit that we do, mm -hmm. and care for what we want to achieve together, which is unparalleled. The future is up for us to decide where it's going to be, and it's up for us to decide how quickly we want to act on to get there. Mm -hmm. That's the mindset. But more importantly, on how do we continuously decide that we want to do more and better, 
the best way to do this, to be honest, is to just go speak to our customers. And when I say speak to customers, I don't mean speak to other passengers. Huh? We unfortunately are at a slightly different situation where we have a lot of bugs and a lot of feedback <laughs> being logged and complained about every single day. Right? The number of tickets that come into our call centers, they are fantastic feedback and we act on all of them. We do all sorts of correlations, data analysis, NPS, VOCs, you name it, to make sure that we are constantly working on the most important customer problem. But those problems are usually the problems that they face with the current experience. When we decide to go spend time with a customer, and let me give you an example. When we go spend time with a grab bike driver in Vietnam, in Indonesia, see how they live their lives, the fact that they start their days 4 a.m. in the morning, drive 13 hours straight, and this is an average biker, right? And when you follow him back home, or what it looks like to actually live his life in the sun every single day, waiting for the next job, waiting for the next food delivery or the next parcel delivery. F, right? You're like, sorry, I was thinking of how to not use that word, but apologies, it came out, right? You're like, oh my gosh, there are so many more ways that we can help this individual. And there's so many things that we're currently doing with our current experience that makes his or her life difficult. Shit, let's get back at it, right? And this is not just for drivers, it's for our merchants, it's for our agent partners, of course our passengers as well. And when you speak to them, more importantly, when you just observe, listen and watch, you're like, a million and one different ideas come into your mind on what we can and should be doing better. And this is what we're trying to ingrain in the company more and more. Right? It shouldn't just be coming from our leaders. And to be honest, it doesn't anymore. Um, most of our folks are constantly proposing ideas that we then urge them to, to grow into bigger ideas at faster paces. And we try to ingrain this into our DNA across multiple stages. Um, over the course of the last few years, we're doing it pretty ad hoc. You know, we send our folks over to call centers to take calls or um, shadow our agents. Now, as part of our Grab onboarding, we have a three-day onboarding program that we're starting to roll out across the globe, which involves spending time with our Grab food delivery guys, our Grab food merchants, Grab pay merchants, Grab express merchants, delivery guys as well, and passengers. You also get to become a driver if you have a license. If you don't, I'm sorry, right? And, and being in their shoes truly then just makes us realize and value our customers in a multi-sided platform. That is what gives us the ambition to want to do more when we put ourselves in the shoes of others who are less fortunate than us and just say, yeah, that, that's there. The bigger, better thing, you know, that's typical. Uh, sorry, if, if you want to join by Grab, default, right? by default, that's how we are always thinking, which is, hey, how do we do this faster, better for our customers? And what do we need to do to support you and each other to get there? And as long as it's doable, it's within our constraints, we will do whatever we can to do it. We will make a shit ton of mistakes along the way. Trust me, we continue to do so. But our aspiration is to learn from everyone and not repeat the stupid ones. And the aspiration is to do more, do better, and make new mistakes every single day. Great. No, thank you so much. You, both of you operate in an ecosystem in Singapore to address the opportunity in Southeast Asia. And thanks for sharing your experiences. From your perspective, what has changed in Singapore's technology ecosystem that is driving this growth of startups growing, more startups being formed, big com companies coming in, and truly from a talent perspective, what we're starting to see is that talent is starting to circulate across big companies, small companies, fast-growing companies, not just within the tech sector, but from banking, from consulting, from manufacturing. You're seeing talent move across Singapore's ecosystem. What is your take of that? Maybe this time I'll start with waiting first. We tiger. Now, now we have a formula going forward. Okay. Um, I would like to believe that you know, early co-founders like ourselves have or had a role to play in it. Um, because I do remember when we first started, this ecosystem definitely did not exist at all. In fact, it felt like we were constantly swimming upstream. Constantly. And in many ways, oftentimes, I didn't want to tell people what I was doing because they were like, huh? <laughs> tell, say that again, what? Right? And 
it's because over time, I think folks have realized that the ambition and the passion and the impact that we're trying to have is actually truly there. And it's not just in words, it's not just in PowerPoint decks that we go you know, speak to partners about, speak to investors about, but we're actually having you know, real substantial change on the ground. I remember one of the fondest moments I had, and this was many years ago, it was probably one and a half years into uh, the history of Grab. We started the company out to solve safety for taxis and driver utilization earnings for the drivers, right? So passengers could actually take safe, efficient rides, which were, trust me, not at all what you would uh, yeah, think of in terms of Southeast Asian taxi services outside of Singapore, right? And what happened at some event that I was at, it wasn't even a startup event, it was just some, I think, alumni event. Someone found out that I was, at that point in time, with my taxi or, or Grab Taxi, and they just came up to me and like, oh, Oh, you started this app. Thank you so much. Because I now send my daughter to school every single day with this app. And I happily put her into a taxi because I know you guys are safer. I also sent my mom to the hospital just last week with Grab, right? I was like, yes. Right? That was a moment in my life where I recall, we're like, shit. We've achieved what we thought was going to be an impossible dream. What everybody told us was impossible. And then the big aha moment, I was like, shit moment, was like, okay, we're one and a half years in, what do we do next? <laughs> right? And that was the start of how we are continuously pushing ourselves to do more and better, because that was the first point where I said, I guess we've achieved milestone number one. We should try to do and find out what milestone number two is, so that we can, again, cheesily drive Southeast Asia forward. Yeah, I, I think this is something also quite dear to... Um, hearts. Um, so, so like Quilling mentioned in 2012, like six, seven years ago, there was pretty much nothing um, in the tech or startup ecosystem in Singapore. But, but that's also not super true. Um, so so I, I think we, we also kind of built off a lot of the early work that was put in by um, even earlier batches of entrepreneurs. Actually, I'm not sure you guys know in the room also, we've got one of our, our early heroes, um, entrepreneurs like Wen Xiang from Zopim. Uh, so yeah. we, we actually really look up to entrepreneurs like Wen Xiang, Royston, Darius, who were, you know, like internet entrepreneurs when there was zero ecosystem. Yeah. Like when we started Carousel, I think there was a little bit of an ecosystem. So we went back. Um, there was this thing called Block 71. It was this government experiment. So if you guys don't know, there's this JTC building that was um, dilapidated. They kind of spructed it up a bit. Uh, decided to just shove startups and like um, incubators and entrepreneurs together in one room. And it was half empty. Um, and that was before it was officially named Launchpad and all that like really cool stuff. And today, um, there's now, if I'm not wrong, seven, eight blocks. It's entirely full. There's a waiting list to get in. Um, and I think one of these international publications called it the densest place of startups yeah. in the world, right? I, I don't know which one was that. That's right. Um, and, and I think part of it was fueled by a couple of phenomenons. One is you know, things like a critical mass of people who wanted to do startups and join startups. So programs like the NOC program, I think, helped. So if you just throw a stone at any startup in Singapore, quite likely there's some semblance of an NOC influence there. Um, second thing is just the whole... Uh, acceleration of venture capital in Southeast Asia. So when we were about one, two years in, starting two, three, four years ago, there suddenly at least half a dozen, a dozen, 50 to $100 million venture capital funds solving for the seed, Series A, B rounds. Uh, and that's super encouraging. So today, you want to do a consumer internet company, actually be pre-revenue for a couple of years, it's actually doable. Um, and I know that because... Carousel, they make money for four or five years. And um, initially, in 2012, 2013, when we went around the circuit, people were saying, like, what are you doing? SPH and eBay is going to crush you one day. Um, how do you make money? But today, uh, you see a lot more deep tech startups, consumer internet companies. You've got global investors like Sequoia Capital, Rakuten, 500, investing in the ecosystem. They know what a good 
internet company looks like, that thinks long term, that actually solves for meaningful problems, and sometimes look different from what a fiscal year would expect from a company, <laughs> right? So I, I think things are changing. Like Huiling mentioned, 55 plus nationalities in your company. You know, Carousel has got not so many. We've got now 22, but still quite a lot. And I, I think today we have what is the most beautiful enabler of tech and startups where you can build truly global internet companies from everywhere because infrastructure to build um, services with Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, you can do it anywhere today. You have got global distribution networks with the App Store, Play Store. You've got global talent, so we mentioned we've got 22 nationalities. You've got global investors in Singapore. And I think a lot of what is limiting us is our minds. Um, and you know, that's something that Carousel feels quite you know, proud and passionate to try and change. And we're trying to push the boundaries. And we feel um, that it's extremely possible to build a truly global internet company that makes profound, meaningful impact worldwide from Singapore. Will it take a while? I think it will take a while. But it's exactly why we want to dedicate our lives to building an enduring organization. Great, thanks so much. I'm looking at the questions, so please feel free to like up questions that you really want to ask. I'm going to ask the second most important question so far. Uh, this really is for, for you, Huiling. Uh, and it's about really competition in Southeast Asia. It's about competition and how competition can help you sharpen your soul or affect your strategy, right? So it's coming from Javon, who is uh, with Corporate Strategy at Visa. Um, considering Uber's exit, congratulations on that. It's also one of your shareholders now. Um, and Gojek's expansion in Southeast Asia, do you think it will be a winner-take-all? Or will there be enough opportunity for a few players to coexist in the super app grab funding ecosystem? Hui Ling, take it away. So there are a couple of ways to answer this question, but I'm going to decide to take this from a customer-centric perspective, right? If you were to look at this from a purely competitive ecosystem, you're like, you know, is it going to be winner-take-all? Is it going to be multiple players? That's a very competitor, player-specific perspective. Our perspective is, you know, if we focus on the customer and we just help to develop the best solutions for them, whether it's on the app, whether it's a combination of the O2O -O connectivity, ultimately, they will decide what they prefer to use, where they prefer to use, how they prefer to use it, right? Of course, there's going to be constant competition in the market. Um, since that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. Uh, we, we have a favorite saying, and I'm copying this from my um, dear co-founder. It's one of his favorites, right? Iron sharpens iron. I really don't believe that Grab would be anywhere close to where it is today if we haven't had consistent competition from all angles, local, global, regional, since we started the company. That for the longest time, there were always better funded companies with more talent, with better technology, that we always felt like, how are, well. right? So that ecosystem actually enabled us to become what we are today. And we expect competition to continuously exist because ultimately customers want choices and Choices are the ones that help us realize, hey, there are different ways of doing things that we haven't tried before that could be better. One thing we are trying to do that's different, though, going forward, now that we have reached a different scale that we did not have before, we're still in many ways you know, trying to figure out how to fight for the future, fight for our future as well as the region's future. Right? One thing that we want to do very differently is take a partnership approach. We're tired. We're tired of saying that, you know, everybody has to fight everybody. So after the Uber acquisition last year, and this happened only in, we announced it in April, it happened in May or June or something of that sort, right? But it's approximately a year ago. In June, July, we launched our Grab platform strategy, which was literally the underpinnings of what we hope to be the future not just from a super app perspective, but a partnership first perspective. Uh, I'll share that you know, on our board of directors or our investors right now, we have Uber, we have Didi. I'm like, whoa, right? We have multiple different banks from many different countries in the region, right? We have different OEMs from different car companies. 
we want to bring the best together and we want to create a platform where we can all work together rather than fight with each other because the future is not about the existing pie that we have today and just trying to like you know fight over the crumbs and nibbles and the slice or, or the size of the slice of the pie the future is about how much bigger we can expand it and earlier everything that we talked about especially in southeast asia we are so early in this pie growth right Maybe pies don't grow on their own, lah. so maybe this tree, that, this tree that's growing from a plant into a tree right now, yeah. there's so much more into this future for this region that if we do it together, all of us will be better off. For sure, our customers will be better off. And for sure, we will be as well. Because wherever you create value, there's value to be contributed back to your shareholders, right? So that's how we think about competition. Competition will always be there. Competition makes us better, and in fact, we're extremely grateful because in so many ways, we would not be here where we are today if it weren't for all the amazing folks that we've had the opportunity to learn from. And going forward, we're trying to pivot this into saying, instead of fighting over the same thing, can we create something bigger together and bring as many diverse players to the platform as possible and just say, how can we best contribute to this holistically? No, e-commerce is a big category killer in terms of growth in Southeast Asia. You have many big players in that space from Alibaba, Amazon, Lazada. And this is a very hyper-local business. As you go regional, how do you frame competition and what is your approach to that? You know, I think one of the things that uh, most people kind of... So I, I like to add to the point of competition. Like, you know, one of the things about um, competition is that if you're solving a meaningful problem and big enough problem, there'll always be competition, right? Um, and, and the only like, approach to competition is, in, in our minds is that it, it's very hard to, to control what your competitors do, but you can control how you serve your customers. And I think if you just stay focused and, and obsessed about them, like, that's probably the single most productive thing that you can do uh, versus obsessing about competition. Um, that said, you know, I think for us, the e-commerce ecosystem is um, definitely a booming one. And you know, one of the misconceptions of Carousel is that we are actually e-commerce per se. Um, but actually, if you think about most of the e-commerce platforms, 99%, 100% of their seller bases are actually merchants and um, businesses and whatnot. Uh, if you look at Carousel, 99% of our sellers are actually individuals like you and I. It's about you selling um, your underutilized items and unused items in your life, which is a, a pretty, pretty unique thing. Uh, so one of the things that we have to try and do is kind of change uh, mindsets, right? Which is what our vision really is. How can we make um, secondhand actually the first choice down the road? Um, and, and we do think that e-commerce growth is actually net-net beneficial because when you actually have to buy so many things and you've got bought so many things, you've got too many things in your life, you've got to get rid of them. So, so we kind of close that loop in the circular economy. Um, but I think more importantly, how can we even just switch up the way people think about commerce? It's something that is actually quite fascinating for us. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, from Denise Ang, looking at strategic partnerships at Google. So what do you find surprisingly, good or bad, about starting a business with Singapore as the base? Do you think that Singapore is a good note to start a business that serves Southeast Asia? Now let me rephrase that a bit. We spoke a lot about why Singapore is a good location to do some of these things. Maybe let me focus on what are your challenges running a regional business from Singapore that you're finding some challenges operating on the ground on? All the ministers are no longer here. <laughs> Can I get it's a okay. quick promise from the ED no folks that nothing will get back to their ears? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Support won't change either. No. Um, uh, firstly, I, I do have to put out a qualifier that, to be honest, uh, we've been extremely fortunate to have the continued support from multiple dimensions, um, from various entities, right, um, in, in Singapore and the region. And it's, it wouldn't have been possible if that support hadn't had kickstarted, and we would not be here where we are today, right? So initially, it was extremely challenging, but over time, it got easier, and we only have you guys and girls to thank. So... The positive stuff, a lot of what was mentioned before, completely agree, 200% agree, and have great personal examples. But in terms of some of the challenges, I'll, I'll share a couple. There are three in my mind that come up. I hope I remember all three as I talk about them, right? One is talent is a problem, folks. 
There is a right reason why there are two ministers here and multiple folks that have been dragged from halfway around the, the globe, which is technically home, to spend time with all of you because we, we need you guys and girls back home. Right? Um, and you know, Singapore, Southeast Asia, we're in a region where we have a lot of amazing, talented, bright, hungry people. But no, they're not all where we need them. So the little red dot and beyond needs you. <laughs> That's one. Secondly, um, there was a word mentioned earlier, and apologies if I repeat it. Um, sterile isn't exactly the word I would use. It's the fact that we, and, and I know this as a, a child who grew up in the Southeast Asian education system, we don't encourage creativity and innovation as much as some other cultures do. And the question is, how do we do that, right? I don't think we're at all sterile, but I do think that we could push the bound boundaries more. The third one I cannot remember. When I remember, I will say after he finishes speaking. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, I, I think I agree with a lot of that, right? And, and it's... You know, one of the things that, that for us is that we, as we scale the organization, one of our, our biggest growth challenges was actually um, talent. It's a constant thing. I, I think it's actually a global problem. Um, and, and so, you know, when, when one of the things that, we, that really kind of put us in a almost existential kind of a state was actually about two years, three years in. Um, we were, I think our servers were going down every other day. Um, and we had just no idea like what to do. Like, we just pressed this. We had this thing called Super, which is just restarting the system, right? Like, <laughs> and I think we actually also went to Wenxiang for help. And but eventually, you know, we had to turn to uh, engineers who have seen scale. So one of our investors, Sequoia, actually helped to um, help us um, introduce a couple of candidates and, and, and good people from the former Zingers, Amazons, Flipkarts, and you know they moved over to help run our infra team. And you know, today I can actually sleep with a lot more peace, like of mine, um, and our service you know, don't go down as much anymore. So, one of the things that I'm reflecting on is that when, when I just spend this past week here and looking in this room, there's actually so many talented people here who have actually seen scale. And why we turned to the former Amazon Flipkart guys who actually relocated from India to Singapore to join us was because they had that experience in scale. It's such a pity that we actually have so many people of you here who are immensely talented, seen scale. Um, there are actually really meaningful problems to be solved at home that uh, you, know, you guys are not coming home to solve these problems. So I, I think it's, it's actually going to be um, really interesting to, to get to interact with some of you guys outside to understand uh, why, why is it that you know, there are such meaningful problems to be solved back home, uh, but you're still spending some time. And don't get me wrong, I think spending time here is important. We need a lot of you guys to go and learn from the best in the world, set the standard, uh, work with the bar raisers, and then come back home to be the bar raisers, to help elevate the overall ecosystem. Second thing, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, come back home also. Because when we were here in Silicon Valley, I think starting back in Singapore was a little bit of an advantage. You know, we had applied to 500 and YC here, we got rejected. Um, you know, so thankfully, 500 now is an investor. But you know, I think coming back home, there's a lot less noise. Um, you'll be able to just really focus on doing great work, solving a problem. Um, and because of your experience in the established ecosystems, I think you'll be able to stand out a little bit more. Um, and that's something I experienced myself. So, no, two, two angles. At, at. Yeah. Yeah. You remember the third one, Wheeling? Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for giving me time. That was a good failure, time. right? High five. High five, yeah. man. Teamwork. <laughs> Not at all rehearsed. Yeah. Um, third and last point is, again, opportunity as well as a challenge, right? Every challenge is an opportunity. Um, you guys know Singapore is not the biggest market in the world. <laughs> We're a dot. We're five million in terms of population. Therefore, if you want to build a business that's just focused on Singapore, it's not going to work. Yeah. Right. At the same time, trying to build a regional business to get scale is bloody difficult. Folks, um, like even in Vietnam, we have offices in Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh. The cultures are different. The way our grabbers from both offices work and their underlying assumptions are also different. 
let alone Indonesia that has how many hundred, uh, thousand islands, depends on who counts, right? Seven, eleven thousand, I have no idea, right? That is the challenge and the opportunity of being based out of the region. So, there is hope, because hopefully us idiots on stage here are not doing terrible things, and we are hopefully showing that it is possible to build for scale in a very complex market. And if you can make it work, oh my gosh, the world's an oyster, because not many people can, right? And again, if you'd like to don red or don green, please, we have booths outside. <laughs> if you want to go start your own venture as well, this guy is here as well. So we're all on stage here to, to help bring you home or see how we can support you here as well so that there is a longer term journey together, right? Um, if that's the last class of today. Yes, a very quick one before we end. And this is really a personal question for both of you. So the year is 2012 when you were just about to start this uh, company, you're a founder, you're an entrepreneur, now you're a leader of a large organization. What advice would you give your 2012 self about what you know now in terms of leadership advice? Short. Siri. Why me first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know, knowing what I know now, like my advice back to the 2012 self would be, um, You know, you, you just got to be absolutely passionate and, and in what you do and you got to understand why you do what you do uh, because it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult and that's what's going to anchor you and your organization to just survive every trial and tribulation that's going to be thrown your way. And, and rest assured, like, you know, seven years in, it's not gotten any easier. It's only getting harder. Um, and, you know, looking back, like, I would just like to warn that 2012 self of myself that if I'm going to be embarking on this, just know that it's going to be a, a multi-year journey. Um, and after seven years in, I still think we're less than 1% done. And the only reason why I kept going was just this deep sense of care for the mission that we're on. Thank you. Willing. Two pieces of advice from my 2012 self. One, you have much to learn, my friend. <laughs> You'll be making many mistakes, and to be honest, you know much less than you ever believe or think that you will or do know and just get ready to learn and make mistakes and be humble about it and, and take every fall with grace and more importantly, come back stronger. Um, yeah, that would be my advice to myself. The second one would be culture matters. Culture is not a one-off project. It's not a project you do once or you know here and there. Certain quarters, not others. It needs to be one of the top three priorities on your leadership you know, OKRs, for us we use OKRs, every single quarter, every single half, every single year. Because the moment you stop looking at it, especially as a high growth company, it, its natural momentum is chaos, right? Um, so those were the two I would give back to my old self and I kind of wish I had a time machine now. Well, a big round of applause uh, for Siri and Hui Ling. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope you enjoyed that session. Thank you.